Good evening, good evening everybody, uh, and welcome to tonight's event. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you here to this event on human rights and climate change. Uh, the global climate crisis is a human rights crisis. My name is Amanda Slevin. I am an environmental sociologist, a climate activist, and I direct the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action. And it's our Centre SECA, which is co-hosting this event tonight as part of the NI Festival of Human Rights. So I'm really thrilled to welcome you here. And to give you a sense about how excited I am to have you here, I want to give you a bit of background to our centre. Uh, three years ago, uh, my dear colleague, Professor John Barry, who you'll, you'll meet tonight, uh, was invited to become director of the Centre for the Study of Risk and Inequality. And John asked me to take over and, and to work with him as co-director of the Centre. And, and John and I, you know, similar souls, thought, well, we need a title that better reflects, reflects what we do. That we're not doing research just for objective analytical purposes, that we're doing research that is socially and ecologically important, that is about research that has impact and brings about change. And so we come up with the name, the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action. And I'm thrilled that tonight's special event touches on all three key themes of our centre, our three pillars of sustainability, equality and climate action. There is no doubt in this area of climate and ecological breakdown that human rights are among the most pressing and, and issues that we're facing locally and globally. The injustices that many face uh, already, uh, and these injustices are going to ex be exacerbated as the climate breakdown accelerates. These are key issues for all of us to address. And so I'm thrilled that we have two amazing women here tonight who are going to touch on and focus on these key issues from different perspectives using different methods. Um, so our two speakers are, we'll begin with Alison Kilpatrick, um, and I'm thrilled to uh, introduce Alison, who is the Chief Commissioner for the Human Rights, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Alison is a barrister um, and a human rights specialist, focused on socioeconomic injustices, and she was an advisor to the policing board. Alison uh, has spent a lot of time advising governments on embedding human rights and legislation or practices. And Alison's going to be talking about human rights and impacts of climate change, uh, looking at how the global planetary emergency is also a human rights crisis. Climate change is caused by human activity and denying or limiting access of many people to a wide range of human rights, as I mentioned, locally and globally. I'm also excited to share that we will have a poetry reading from Belfast-based poet Neve McNally. Neve completed her master's in Ulster University, where she co-edited, uh, co-created and edited the paperclip. Since then, Neve has been a facilitator in the Seamus Heaney Home Place, and her poetry can be seen in a wide range of publications, such as the Tulsa Review, Tiernan Oak, Capsule Stories, the Galway Review, um, and, and others. Neve's poetry has featured on the BBC and in the NI Human Rights Commission film, It Seems, which focuses on the climate crisis. Her poem, If Stones Could Speak, If Stone Could Speak, was showcased by Bushmills as promotion for the cause of collection. And Neve's most recent poetry film, Defining Hope, premiered at the Business in Community 2021 Responsible Business Awards. This year, Neve has spoken at Ulster University's Writing for the Earth Symposium, the John Hewitt Society's Tending Our Planet Symposium, and has, has taken eco poetry workshops and the Ulster Museum. So I think tonight we're going to have a really special combination and an, of analysis uh, and action and creative exploration of the most pressing issues facing our time. And I'd like to welcome you all here on behalf of my colleagues and to thank my colleagues who have organised tonight. Um, so the format for tonight, um, we will open with Alison's talk. Um, we will then go to to Neve, and my dear colleague, Professor John Barry, will be chairing tonight's event. So I'd like to thank John for all his work organising tonight's event, and also thank um, Callum McGowan and Theresa Hill, our colleagues in the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action, for all their great work organising the event. Um, tonight, I think, is an important event that will really explore the powerful role we all have in effect and change, and, and really emphasising that human rights are crucial to uh, transformation for society and tackling the climate emergency. So I have to apologise in advance, I'm going to, have to leave a wee bit early, um, but I hope that you will all find this event as powerful and stimulating as I'm sure it will be. And I look forward to seeing you at more of our events and taking part in other SEC activities. So thank you very much. Very well, I'd like to see you here tonight and I'd like to welcome Alison Kilpatrick. Thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone. It's lovely to see so many people here on a very cold evening. Um, 
I was delighted to hear that I was going first because there's no way I can follow <laughs> Neve Kelly. And uh, I promise you, wait around and, and you'll be rewarded. Um, let me find my space here. So, John Barry, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, but also thank you for being one of those people who's been championing this issue before most of us even knew that there was an issue or that human rights were linked so closely to it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and I think we all have taken a steer from you uh, over the last couple of years. This series of se seminars, it seems to me, is exactly what is needed right now. Um, and the world is facing multiple challenges, not least the, the challenge of climate change. What I want to start with is to state, and I want this to be unequivocal, I can't believe there is some debate still debate about this, but I want to state unequivocally that the climate crisis is a clear and present danger, that it is man-made. And while it's the greatest threat to human rights across the world, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that uh, in a while, it can also be the solution. So it can be the solution to climate change across the world. It was my great privilege to have been appointed as Chief Commissioner at the Human Rights Commission. Um, I've been in the job now 14 months. Sometimes it feels like years and other times it feels like five <laughs> minutes. Tonight it feels like five minutes. Um, but it, it has been a real privilege and an honour. Um, and what we are supposed to do, what my job is um, with my colleagues, is to try and ensure that human rights are upheld, they're respected, protected in all areas. But what we realise that there are some things that are almost too big for us. And climate change is one of those. So we're going to leave it to the scientists and politicians and all those people um, who are going to come up with the, 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 the change management. But what we can do is look at the impact of climate change and its effect on human rights. And that's what we're very keen to do, hopefully working uh, more closely with you. We're doing our job um, monitoring um, and hopefully enforcing uh, rights protections, but we're doing it against a backdrop of we've all suffered um, COVID-19. We still are. Um, a health service that is, I'm going to use the word buckling. It's not the Commission's word, um, but it's mine. And I think anyone watching even just the most recent news, I don't think anyone um, believes the health service is there for us uh, in the way that it should be. Not their fault. Um, but more, better provision must be made. This is also at a time of cost of living crisis, and, and we're seeing another health crisis potentially on the horizon. So it's a lot for people to deal with. It's, it's frightening. It's frightening for people like us even, um, but it's frightening for people with young families, people who are living in poverty, don't own their own homes, for example. It is absolutely terrifying. And the last thing on their minds is climate change, or even their own human rights. What they're thinking about is, how do I get through tonight? Can I turn the heat on tonight? Can I feed my children? Can I get them up in the morning, and give them breakfast? However, and that's absolutely understandable, we can't ignore climate change because those things will only be made worse if we don't tackle the climate uh, crisis. And it is tempting, um, I think, to close your ears when the, the crisis seems too big or you're not quite sure what you can do about it. Uh, and think, you know, we've got enough to deal with. Um, as I say, listen to the news earlier this evening, um, and I, I had to switch it off and, and just come here because it was just too depressing. Uh, there's so many things that we need to, to focus on, that climate change is already being pushed to the back of the news stories, to the later news or, or the broadsheets. And the question that I could ask when I, when I told somebody uh, earlier on today that I was coming here to talk about climate change, um, I got quite a, a hostile reception um, to the idea and, and what they actually said was, how can you talk about climate change while there is a cost of living crisis and the health service has failed? Are they not more uh, immediate impact on people's enjoyment of their human rights? And it's very, it's quite hard. That's quite a hard question to answer because, of course, they're right to an extent. But ignoring climate change, as I say, is not going to solve anything. It's only going to make it worse. The two um, it points I want to make tonight, um, I think, and I'm not going to take terribly long. I do want to let Neve have the uh, have the floor. But that, firstly, that the ill health of the planet that is immediately and catastrophically undermining human rights protection across the world, here as well as abroad. And there might be a hierarchy of suffering at this stage. So, for example, some people are suffering worse than others. Some countries are suffering worse than others. 
but it has had an effect on us already. And let's be absolutely blunt about it. It is going to have a greater effect, effect and we're all going to suffer increasingly. There is no time to spare to worry about other things. If we can avoid the worst effects of climate change for a bit longer, even if we buy our way out of its immediate effects, there are people across the world who can't. They can't now buy themselves out of the worst effects of climate change. So if you believe in human rights at all, then you must believe in helping those people who are less able to help themselves. And that means uh, from the effects of climate change. The climate crisis, and I quote, is the biggest threat to our survival as a species and is already threatening human rights around the world. That's not my, uh, those aren't my words, that's the assessment of the Secretary General to the Human Rights Council. And that was two years ago, lots changed in two years and it hasn't got better. But you can assume he knows what he's talking about. The latest reports uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change confirm that we're living, <clears throat> they use the expression climate emergency and describe it as code red for humanity. And I'm not sure we can disagree with that. Another person who knows what he's talking about is uh, former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and he reminded us, and I quote, climate change is intrinsically linked to public health, food, water security, migration, peace, security. It is a moral issue. It is an issue of social justice, human rights, and fundamental ethics. We have a profound responsibility to the fragile web of life on this earth and to this generation and those that will follow. So to people who genuinely simply feel unable to do anything about it or feel that they have enough on their own doorsteps, and those people who really don't care enough. Um, we should be repeating that message to them. They have to care or it'll be too late. As I said at the beginning, it's beyond dispute that it's caused by man. Um, and that if we don't do something about it, it's only going to get worse. We have a duty, each of us to our neighbours, individually and also um, to our, uh, our the countries around the world to whom we are neighbours, to do something about it. Now, my I stretch to say expertise, certainly my experience <clears throat> is with human rights, using human rights. Uh, we call it a human rights based approach, but it's using this approach of human rights provides solutions to things. And it can seem very theoretical. It can seem very impractical. Um, it's just a lot of lawyers chatting about academic stuff. Um, I'm glad I said stuff. <laughs> I'm so close to saying something else. Um, <laughs> It's very, very close. Um, academic stuff. Um, but it, it, it's not academic. Um, and human rights are not academic. They're very practical. And if we understand them and, and we really try and come up with a, a solution um, to climate change, then I, I do think human rights are, are the way to do that. States have an obligation. They have all sorts of obligations under international law. Um, but sadly, we hear at the minute that some states don't take their obligations under international law terribly seriously. So we need also to appeal to their um, sense of selfishness and also let's hope their um, better natures. States have responsibility in particular to mobilise the maximum available resources for sustainable human rights based development and they have a duty to support climate action. And that's not, as I say, that's not in some little piece of guide, guidelines. That is an international uh, obligation. Many low income countries are the hardest hit, but they can't do the work alone. So we've got to be able to lend our time and our money and our resources to those countries that are struggling. International cooperation is essential to address the causes and effects of climate change. And as I say, taking a human rights based approach, we believe is certainly one of the solutions, if not the solution. It means you start with international uh, human rights and laws directed to promoting and protecting human rights, and then you work out from that what you're trying to achieve and, and, and how human rights can help you. You have to identify inequalities and abuses and it makes you really think about it. it, makes you look around you and see who needs more help, who is suffering more than we are. Then you develop practical action plans to prevent those human rights abuses from continuing. And it's a, it's, it, I think it's a beautifully simple but also broad concept because it encompasses social, cultural, political, economic issues. It empowers people. It tells them they have some control, some agency over their own destiny. And that's particularly important if you're already marginalised or vulnerable. Human rights give individuals and peoples a voice. And it tells them that they are important, even if they feel very small and haven't had a voice before. Human rights are placed with the human rights approach at the centre of all um, states action plans, policies, programmes. So it really works its way through uh, everything you do and it gives you something to monitor as well and hold them to account for.
I'm realizing I'm already running over. I've already started, I think Neve and I talked about this earlier, rambling. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't, but I've already started. So let me cut to the quick. Um, to make sure that states take their obligations seriously, their international obligations seriously, um, it's worth knowing what those obligations are and where they're contained. So there are a number um, of UN processes, uh, including the Universal Periodic Review, and they examine human rights record of UN member states and they apply a number of treaties and instruments. I'm not going to mention all of them to you, but I'm going to come to a couple of them. The United Nations, the reason they monitor this stuff and the reason they have developed specific human rights um, and climate change um, protocols and plans and guidance is because they know that a healthy planet is more likely to be human rights compliant. They also know a human rights compliant planet is much less likely to suffer climate change. Now, they're the experts. If they've decided that, I'm not going to argue with them. Many nations around the world have signed up to standards and when they ratify them, they consent to be bound by them. And we need to remind states, you don't sign up to these things willy nilly. If you sign them, we're going to take you at your word and hold you to them. And states should um, take seriously the internet, the obligations that they've signed up to. Breach of international obligations really matters. Let's start with, for example, um, the Paris Agreement 2016. That's probably one of the most famous ones. What it says is that each state should, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, consider respective obligations on human rights as part of its legally binding goals to limit global warning, warming. So again, tying it into legally binding goals. It's not enough just to try a bit harder. In terms of global policymaking, 2021 saw two milestones related to human rights, climate change and the environment at the Human Rights Council. And there they recognised, and it may seem self-evident, um, but it hadn't really been said before. They recognised that a clean, healthy, sustainable environment is a universal human right. Its resolution, um, I think I've got these numbers right, 4813, Lisa will <laughs> know better, um, that recognised that environmental degradation and climate change were interconnected human rights crises. They acknowledged the massive damage inflicted by climate change and environmental destruction on millions of people worldwide. So I say it's not the people who know what they're talking about are telling us this. Council's resolution, uh, a further resolution 4814, uh, created a special rapporteur on human rights and climate change. That's a man called Fry, Ian Fry. His mandate will include contributing towards ongoing efforts at all levels to address the adverse impact of climate change on the enjoyment of human rights. This is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, that's Dr David um, Boyd. So there are these people now focusing on, with resources, uh, how they can use human rights to tackle the issue. There's the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. That's been adopted by all uh, United Nations member states, I think as back, far back as 2015. And that is a blueprint for peace and prosperity now and into the future. Sustainable development goals, 17 of them. Um, I suspect looking around this room that most of you know what those are, so I'm not going to waste your time trying to show off. Um, but all of this work um, has, has to go in tandem with, and this is one of the great struggles, it is happening at the same time as climate change. It is happening at the same time as the oceans are rising, at the same time as our forests are being destroyed, at the same time as we're losing habitats, livelihoods are being destroyed. It's really difficult to motivate people to look to the future when they have very little to look to in the present. I'm often asked what human rights exactly um, are affected by climate change. And that's usually said in a, a slightly snide way, um, asking for evidence. But it's easier to say what rights aren't affected by climate change, because in my view, every every one of them is. But just to give you a few um, more solid examples, based on a wide range of UN treaties and declarations, there's the right to life. Um, that's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There's also the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the UN Human Rights Committee has said environmental degradation, climate change. Um, I think I've already actually read this one out to you but certainly focusing on threats to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy the right to life. There's the right to health, sustainable environment. We've already uh, looked at that one. Climate change is one interesting one where I find it interesting is um, the right to culture. 
Um, because culture is one of those things that's quite hard to define. We think we know what it is. Um, we certainly think we know what our own culture is, but less maybe forgiving of other people's. But there is a right to culture, and it's recognised that climate change has an enormous impact on uh, cultural enjoyment and livelihoods. Climate-related displacement and migration, and we're seeing that again in the news today, um, more and more people, individuals and peoples, migrating to avoid the consequences of it. I was at a, a talk recently by a, a man who works uh, across the world in relation to counterterrorism, and he was asked, and he, all he'd been talking about was policing and security, national security, and he was asked what the biggest threat was, and everyone was waiting for him to identify a particular terrorist group, and he said climate change. That is the one thing that they're really worried about. Uh, that is what's behind some of these wars. It's what's behind migration. It's what's behind displacement. And they can't deal with it. Climate change is something that they're just not equipped to deal with, but they have the consequences to face and they don't like what they're seeing. Let me raise the tone. I'm going to, um, instead of telling you all the bad things, what I'm going to try and do now is tell you what we're doing, what we're trying to do about it. And I'm sure you have lots of suggestions as to what else we can do. But let me just tell you very briefly where we are. Um, national human rights institutions, and, and we're one of those, the Human Rights Commission is, is one of those. Um, we monitor and advise and we, we do that as much as we can. And we try and remember always to consider this and these issues uh, when we're advising and monitoring. But I think even more important and something is just as large and vast as this is that we empower other people. So we empower the rights holders so they understand what their rights are and they can come to us. They can also enforce them themselves, but they can help us enforce and monitor. But I think in, a, in an, a, an issue which crosses uh, boundaries, which crosses borders, probably the, the greatest impact we can have is as a member of a collaborative body. So we're a member of various uh, networks, but one in particularly important at the minute is the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions. It's just called ENRI, usually it's, as its acronym. But that's 40 national human rights institutions um, and they come together to collaborate. But essentially, and most importantly, they can intervene in court cases and they have been given leave to intervene in court cases. So a number of human rights institutions have a, a voice in a courtroom on some of these climate change cases and it's proving enormously successful. Let me take, um, let me mention one of the cases actually um, that they're involved in at the minute, because I think this probably sums up the main, the, the sort of thrust of most of the cases that are going through the courts at the minute. The I've mentioned the UN treaties and those are great and states do have to comply with them and they're taken to have meant to comply with them. Um, but it's more difficult to directly enforce in a court. What we do have is the European Convention that also applies. So in these cases, it's been the European Convention they've relied on. But for example, violation of the right to life, which is Article 2 of the Convention, um, for anybody out there who's going to issue their claim form, and Article 8, right to respect for private and family life. There are also um, groups of young people who are arguing, and I think this is, this is a fascinating argument, which it's hard to dispute. It'll be interesting to see what the court says about it, that because really they've got more of a life to live and less prospects, um, the way climate change is going, that they're discriminated against on grounds of age. It's fascinating. It's not immediately obvious that they're going to win, but I do think courts will start taking these sorts of arguments more seriously. In respect of one case that's really already finished and really useful, um, worth going and having a look at, it's the Urganda Foundation. It's a Dutch case so against the Netherlands. And it was one where the Dutch government um, was held to have breached its obligations to quote, urgently and significantly reduce emissions in line with its human rights obligations. So failure to reduce emissions was held directly enforceable. The court not only referred to the European Convention, but also international climate instruments. Um, they referred to, for example, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Kyoto Protocol. So we can see how courts, I think, are ready in a way they weren't on any other issues to jump forward and try and find ways of making um, a lot of these unincorporated treaties and obligations directly enforceable in courts because they realise, I think, that contract disputes, tort claims, things like that, they're not going to help us get out of the mess and governments aren't going to do it by themselves. So I think judges are becoming more interventionist and we can have a whole debate about whether or not that's a good thing, but I think they are on this issue, if not uh, on anything else. 
what we're trying to do at the Commission is also uh, identify ways in which we could maybe litigate or help somebody else litigate on some of these issues, raise awareness. Um, my colleagues are, a lot of them are here tonight. I'm sure they'd be delighted to speak to you. They're all, um, I, I'm astounded every day about how much they know about all of these issues, but this one in particular, they're more expert on this than I am. Um, they're going around and trying to remind people of how important this is and how it does tie in with human rights on a daily basis, not just some long point in the future. We have our annual uh, human rights statement. It's to be launched um, next week. And we flagged with Gary Lightbody, in case you're interested. <laughs> I don't know, some of you look too, maybe even too young to know who Gary Lightbody is. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> it's just you and me, Claire. Um, he's, a, he's a pop singer. Very good um, uh, activist, really, in relation to mental health and poverty rights, etc. But he's, he's doing us the great honour of um, launching a report next week. I'm being slightly flippant, but it's it's actually very serious because all the things he's talking about are affected directly by climate change as well. And he will be making links between this huge global issue and these tiny issues that arise within somebody's living room and how the two of them are interconnected and have to be tackled at the same time. Um, we're also, um, and we have uh, experts on this as well, um, the protocol, now we hear everyone talks about the protocol and it always seems to be in a negative sort of tone. We think part of the protocol is actually really good, whatever background you come from, and that's the uh, Article 2, which protects rights, or at least it's supposed to protect rights post-Brexit. We're looking at that and how that um, may tie in with um, environmental protection, climate change, and we have to keep pace with some of the um, equality directives. We don't know if that is going to touch on those, but we're we're trying all angles. We have a forum, um, we have two, for, we have one for business, one for sports, and that's been really interesting. So going directly to businesses and reminding them what they can do on a daily basis and sports as well. So in the process of talking about sports and human rights, it's flagging up the issues caused by sports, caused by business, but also giving them something really uh, positive to work with and something that they can feel proud to introduce. Now that's absolutely enough rambling from me. Um, I think probably the most important thing that can be done at the minute is what we're about to hear, and that's from Neve uh, Kelly. She, she's going to be talking to us for a while, giving us her thoughts, talking about the impact. Um, and there's also a video featuring a poem, specially written um, by Neve. Now, I've it, it's a terrific piece of work, and I'm looking forward to to hearing what else you have to say to it. But this poem, I think, better than I can, certainly better than I have done in the last 30 minutes captures the scale and impact um, of what we're facing and it really is has to be a wake-up call to all of us it was created in conjunction with amnesty international sustainable ni and climate uh, ni uh, with us and, and we're very grateful to them it paints a stark picture but it does remind us that we must well we can still and i think that's the positive message that comes from this we can still seize a small window of opportunity if we just rein in the impacts of what we've done ourselves and what our predecessors have done, and we owe it to the next generation and the generations after that. Listen to Neve. Um, I'm going to be, and I certainly want Neve to work with us some more. Um, it's a great privilege and honour, Neve, to be introducing you. And if I could be as succinct as Neve's about to be, I wouldn't be a lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. spotlight. Hi everyone, how's it going? Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Everyone's giving me far too much credit. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, I owe an awful lot to the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Um, two years ago, I was approached by them and a Galway production company and we're like, do you know anything about climate change? Do you want to do a film? And I was like, huh, imposter syndrome overload. Um, but yeah, I was like, of course. So I sat in a room with intellectuals, academics, um, like nonprofits, um, you know, like all of these scientists, experts on the subject. And I was like, I'm a mere poet. What can I bring to the table? Um, so yeah, this spiraled. Um, the last two years I've went into 
climate activism, um, nature writing, and really focusing on like ecocentric, eco, like eco poetics as well. Um, also, arts role in tackling the climate emergency. Do we have any artists in the room, poets, anyone in the creative sphere? Um, and yeah, this all came from the poem. Um, so I'm going to talk about. I'm going to read a few eco poems tonight. And then I will finish with it seems. So bear with me the next maybe 20, 25 minutes, please. Um, so yeah, um, some things I wanted to think about in that room with everyone tomorrow. I can't believe it feels like yesterday. It's been two years already. Um, things that come into my head, people saying, I won't be here to see it um, until it arrives at our door. Words like, I was like, what can be really personal? Um, my granny just said to me one day, her daffodils bloomed early in February. That was wrong to me. People said then there's no flies on number plates anymore. That's not a thing. These little personal um, you know, moments in your life that are impacted by the climate. Um, and the fact is, I always thought like nature will struggle. Nature will be the one to suffer. But really, everything will continue. It's going to be us. We're not going to be here. Nature will be flying. Do you know, it'll rejuvenate. Um, Venice got dolphins when we were locked inside um, with COVID. So the earth will be fine. It's humans and human rights that will struggle. So thank you, John Barry, of the poets. This is one of my favorite. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite quotes. This is um, when we launched this film. John said to me. In the very end, civilizations perish because they'll listen to their politicians and not to their poets. I'm going to take that one and run with it. Um, yeah, I love this idea that art can make an impact. I'm a firm believer in that. And I'll show you after. But I'm going to go through some of my weird poetry. So a lot of them, um, my poems don't specifically focus on humans. It's a lot um, about the non-human world, which I'm far more interested in. Um, but also our exploitation of the non-human world. Um, I write about oysters, about submerged lighthouses, ivy consuming bricks, um, pints with pig farmers, the lot. So I'm going to go through a few of them tonight. Um, oysters over here. If anyone's had an oyster before, someone told me they were vegan. So I've ran with that because um, <laughs> they don't have a central nervous system and I'm sticking by it. OK, um, so I was like, someone told me they're vegan. So I remember reading this poem by Heaney and he describes eating an oyster and like throwing it back on an icy bed and it was shocked you know these vicious words um sorry um just a warning like kind of like rape imagery um and as a natural world i thought i i had an oyster and was like i'm going to write something similar so this is eating oysters for the first time in green castle after seamus heaney viciously shocked with expert ease the oyster reveals plump plasma a snottery act slurped back divulging pure verb a salty privilege. Front teeth scrape lustrous enamel, shaving a pearly mantle. Prehistoric protection forced onto its back. Smothered with exotic lemon, le petit baton rouge spice that stains the calcium coat. A battered grey sea divot shell exposed on an icy bed. Thank you. So these, this kind of imagery is something I love. Also, I mentioned in it seems ivy consuming every brick. My dad is in the audience tonight and I just sat in the conservatory once and I was looking at the ivy on the back wall and I was like, I love that idea of revenge and consumption and nature actually, you know, coming back to get us. So yeah, this, um, these two poems, the lighthouse over to the left hand side was illustrated by my friend Hannah Sharp. I wrote a poem, um, the lighthouse kind of showing hope if anyone's a Virginia Woolf fan in the in the room as well I love lighthouses and what they mean but the ultimate loss of hope for me would be a submerged lighthouse something that's completely gone the light flickering trying to stay on um and yeah over to the right hand side does anyone did anyone watch is it our planet David Attenborough um this scene was excruciating I wrote these two poems last year around about the same time these walruses were trying to haul out of the water in the Arctic Sea and because there was no ice, they had to climb up the rock face. Loads of them plummeted to their death. And we're watching through the eyes of the camera crew here who are saying, like, I don't understand why they're going up there. Um, so I started writing about these two. So my next two poems are The Lighthouse and A Devastating Scene. The lighthouse needs stacked with a few more stripes, another layer of red and white, to lift its head higher and push its sight above submerging waves. She searches for help, armless, gargling salt water, panicking through the suffocation. Tear ducts flood as light struggles to stay on, like slapping a dying torch with your palm. A hopeless hand, the batteries have drowned. 
Your stripes are wavy underwater, loose in the subsurface, useless through the dark reflection. Your lantern pane will become a cage that fish swim in and lay eggs on. An iris once protected by a metallic eyelid. No boats are coming. No warning is needed for land of serrated rocks below sea level. Inhale quickly, breathe in, blink for the last time. And this is a devastating scene, which was the Guardian um, title when they were writing about this scene from our planet. Did you watch that walrus scene on screen plummeting to their deaths one by one? A tragedy of bodies piled at the base of an 80 foot cliff. Tusks puncture rub blubber, ivory impales backs at bellies, eyes. Life runs from leathery coats into Russian waters under the Arctic skies. Skulls crack on wetted rocks, stacking the beach with figures of furrowed blocks. Wrinkled blobs morph into a mass grave of hemorrhaging greys and browns. Nothing to do but watch. Straight into our lens, your flippers extend, a tilt from the rock face then, spread into a crucifixion pose. A vain execution, a limp creature in slow motion begins its death descent. We watch the body's contortion defeated by the steep incline, the lack of grip, a final tumble, a blind stumble, the hauling out into the water, the stupidity of it all, the fall. Why are they doing this? They aren't made for climbing cliffs. They had nowhere else to go, you replied. They had nowhere else to sit. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're about to move on to, um, can art help tackle the climate emergency? I don't know, um, what you, hands up if you're drinking up. Um, do you, yeah, yes, artists. Um, I do think it can. If um, you meant Alison, like if it's not like awareness is a key theme, um, art brings awareness. And I don't know, controversial. What do you think of this? Um, this is art in itself, I think. But I don't know. It was it was very controversial a couple of weeks ago. Um, Just stop oil. Poured a can of soup over Van Gogh's sunflowers. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of you know in mixed opinion between it. Like they got some recognition, they really did. There was glass in front of the painting. They knew they weren't going to destroy it. But what I love more is Phoebe Plummer, who is to the left. She's actually got a platform for herself. She's doing really, really well in, you know, getting her voice across. She actually said in an interview I seen only two days ago, civil resistance is the only chance we have to get the radical change we need in the time scale we have left. Civil resistance is what we want to do as artists. It's not necessarily you write a poem and get it out there and you're like, yay, climate's fine, you know, um, but it's raising awareness. It's talking about it. It's joining communities. And on a lighthearted note, this is our team. So um, I'm not part of Climate Crack, but I've read at the last two festivals they had, which was the first festival about climate in the north of Ireland slash Northern Ireland. Um, this is Jacinta, she leads it. So they're doing so, so well, it's brilliant. And I got asked to take workshops with these young poets, which was so, so fun. Um, I was taking workshops in the Ulster Museum and it was called Pining for Change or the Pining Poets, as I like to call them. Um, their poets for their poems were then projected on the trees in botanic gardens. This idea that art mixed with nature can, you know, raise awareness in the younger generation. I think we need to look at the younger generation. I'm like, why am I standing up here? We need the, the school kids to get out. They were the ones that led the protests three years ago. Um, so it's all about the younger generation and they're so passionate about it. And we linked up with Climate Crack and they actually read their poems at the festival there in summer. So creating connections, getting out there, finding like-minded people. Um, and yeah, your art will of course flourish. Um, also, like I linked up with um, illustrators. So I also write about nature and writing itself. Um, I meditated on the moon and a crystal night of frozen when tepid tears of reverie betrayed me and chrysanthemums failed to grow. This idea of trees maybe not wanting to limber up when we write about them, maybe trees don't want to, you know, have us prying on their everything. Um, but yeah, linking up with artists, getting involved that way and in print, getting some climate activism going. So yeah, thanks. Like, <laughs> like every good story. Um, begins with a pint, <laughs> but I'm going to read Dark Spectacle first. I have a weird, I developed a weird obsession with moths recently when I found out that they can pollinate at night. I thought this was really good. Um, so yeah, I, I love that idea that like we usually ignore animals. I love focusing on, you know, obviously human rights, but animal rights, 
given them a voice as well, um, which I think it is ignored. Um, so yeah, Dark Spectacle, and this is my poem about moths, which is, yeah. <laughs> we pay no attention to moths unless something bad happens. At your wake, a black soul gem will flicker at an angle to light and capture your soul. Its cracked blacks and greys will match your icy skin, whilst peacock patterned eyes watch your family sleep. I wait for you by my lit window and wonder if you might venture into the twisted bulbs. The light source opens its jaw, a fluorescent Venus flytrap with tormented sirens luring, your, luring you in. You won't light my campsite in fairy tapestry constellations, and you won't sing first thing in the morning. Your powdery symmetry isn't painted on porcelain cups, and children don't want their face painted as you. But when they pin the wings of those ones too, though in crucifix cabinets, they nail their colours to glass tablets and frame their patterns in sapless resin. Would you prefer to be on display that way? Did you know of our trick? It's not the moon. You can't help navigating towards a flame no more than I can help writing about you and about meaning. But the difference is that you are the poetry and to have no hubris like Icarus or us. Escaping the cat's eyes, you pollinate at night whilst the pretty creatures sleep and your fuzzy necks gives me, gives me goosebumps, imagining you near my ears. You came during pillars of change, an inward contortion of easy rotations, of shifting foundations and silence I'm not used to. Dark spectacle, you flicker around our kitchen lampshade loon and suck the shadows from the lightless room. I think of the sun waking us up tomorrow its daily scan with desperate eyes, searching through nettles as you sit in darkness, awaiting the moon. So that was my little obsession with moths, pollination, um, and just a focus on maybe those that are ignored. Um, and I also think it's like these little climate activists that do things at night and no one knows about it, but they're secretly saving the planet. Um, so yeah, a pint with a pig farmer happened. And this is all factual. I was drinking Beamish and this pig farmer was drinking Heineken. And there was a debate to do with meat and livelihoods and what the best thing to do is about the climate. Um, how do you tell someone that's known their whole lives that, um, you know, farming isn't right um, when it's their only sense of livelihood? Um, and for the first time, I had compassion for that. Um, sometimes you can kind of get headstrong and that was one thing when I was asked by the Human Rights Commission to do it, it was like don't preach you can't preach people don't listen if you preach and that's something that I've I've held on to um, you know get your point across but don't don't preach at people so I found myself going oh my goodness I never thought about this um, I thought you meat is of course a big contributor to the climate crisis but also people's livelihoods need change so change actually needs to come from the top down not the bottom up. So there needs to be alternatives. There needs to be workable alternatives for every member of society. You can't just go stop those pigs and then we're fine. Um, so yeah, this is a pint with the pig farmer and it's the last poem I'm gonna read before it seems. So yeah, here we go. We sit here, a table between us and so much difference. You talk canines, overpopulation, and I question if they're sharp enough to rupture arteries leathery flesh in the middle of a field. We use pens differently, yet both secure livelihood, but, but allow pulsating life, one with ink and the other rolling in muck. Those creatures are demonized in literature, though Charlotte's Wilbur was exempt. Are yours like Napoleon, turning snouts into noses who exhale from pipes behind the sheep's backs? There is no harm in you. Your eyes are two of the kindest I know. You cannot change how you've grown, and to blame you would not help. You discuss cost, the need for bacon, ice age, methane, and we sip threats of extinction between pints of Heineken. Morality is sipped between justifications of bodies, sliced for taste, and you explain how it's still needed, wanted, and I can't argue with that. In my mind, Charlotte's stitched salutations remain mapped with intricate design, for Wilbur and how the farmer decided to spur him after communication in scripted reams of web. I wish my phrases could be as silvery as Charlotte's, sticky letters or could have penned or could see of penned creatures. We laugh and hug at the end of the night, angry that we'll never agree. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you.
Okay, thank you guys for listening. Um, yeah, I'm just going to finish with it seems. Um, this is also a quote I live by with regards to art. And if you have a voice, um, if it's painting, if it's photography, if it's script writing, playwright, if you have the words, there's always a chance that you'll find the way. Um, I really do agree with this. Be the change. Maybe don't glue your hand to a wall or a painting, but if you have something you believe in, go for it. Um, I focus a lot on animals um, and the non-human world. Um, but if you want to focus on, you know, if it's human rights, animal rights, if you have a voice, use it in through your art. So thank you. And here's It Seems. It seems that no one chooses to care until the very air we breathe becomes infected and the cigarette chimneys of the fuel industries fill our lungs with smog. It seems that until it arrives at our door, do we choose to ignore those fending for their lives in places that are not here and for people who are not us within our imminent Atlantis. Yet why is it that when we are repeatedly told we are amidst the sixth mass extinction, do we not bat an eyelid? It won't be in my lifetime anyway is a mantra we always say, and the immediacy of our house burning down is tainted by the lack of smoke and the joke, well, I won't be here to see it. And yes, I know we've been told that consuming vegan sausage rolls or refilling metal water bottles will do their part. And yes, they are a start, but let's aim our reduce, reuse and recycling arrows away from our hearts for a minute. Let's instead point them toward those who oppose that climate change is not an issue of human rights and shed some light on a topic that should not be up for discussion. It is often the case that facts trickle through gaps in talks, are, are filtered by the media, strained by companies and diluted into a crisis that barely colours the water. Issues such as flash flooding, bushfires and rapid global emergency feels less like our planet needs surgery and has a sniffle that sugar coats with a cough bottle. It seems we've been told about polar ice caps too often or rising sea levels we cannot see just yet. But my granny telling me that her daffodils bloomed early in February set alarm bells ringing and the lack of dead insects on our car number plates after a drive seemed chilling and warmer winters in this part of the world not seeming like that much of a struggle. There is one misconception though, and it is of this small window of time we have left. When I mention climate change, I think how strange it is we think the planet is in danger. Habitats will grow back without us. Ivy will consume every brick whilst plants dismantle bridges and our buildings will become overgrown ruins. The sea will breathe again beneath its plastic cover and ecosystems will flourish when Mother Nature reclaims what's hers. So this comes down to our future. Our rights to water, shelter, and the very air we breathe is being determined by the greed of big companies. We need to mobilize and rise against those who keep the cure from us, who continue to burn carbon and destroy the rainforests. We must use our voices to undo the choices they make because climate change reaches every single one of us and breaches our very right to life. Thank you.